the Cleveland Cavaliers have been a team that I've been waiting to do a team preview on for a few weeks now. The biggest reason for that was because of the Isaac Okoro situation. Now that he's agreed and he's back with the Cleveland Cavaliers on a three-year, $38 million deal, it's time to get in this team preview because the Cleveland Cavaliers are a team that I think have the potential to shock a lot of people this upcoming season. The Cavaliers are a team that I am quite fond of overall. However, they're only as good as what could possibly happen if they do what I think they have the potential to do this upcoming season. What I mean by that? Well, they're structured with a top-heavy roster and a pretty solid bench as well. But when you look at the star piece on the Cleveland Cavaliers, there are a lot of guys that you have to feed the ball to and guys that you're going to have to situate and see, okay, who's option number one, two, three, four, whatever the case may be. And I think over the past couple of seasons, Bickerstaff did not have them in the proper rotation order in terms of who was the go-to guys. And when I look at this team, you have a guy in Donovan Mitchell who's been the go-to player from the get-go. You then transition out over to having Darius Garland potentially being that guy, Mobley, Jared Allen. All of them were kind of a mixed into that group where there weren't a lot of roles specifically given out. And I think that they missed a massive, massive move there that I think Kenny Atkinson is going to help solve. And so before I break down exactly what I'm talking about on this roster, let me get into Kenny Atkinson because he was a guy that was supposed to take the Charlotte Hornets job a year ago. Surprised that they didn't actually end up retaining him. It, it was unfortunate for, for the Charlotte Hornets. He was the guy that they should have acquired. I think it would have made a drastic difference on that team. But with Kenny Atkinson being in Cleveland, a lot of people forget he built something in Brooklyn alongside Sean Marks that took a team that was regarded as the worst organization, maybe in all of sports, and made them a playoff team. They didn't have high draft picks. They didn't do anything. But what happened was that Kenny Atkinson came in there. He developed guys like Spencer Dinwiddie who was a free agent, Joe Harris, who was a free agent, guys that were drafted in the second round or, or late first round and turn them into legitimate guys that have now become an all-star in Jared Allen, have become legitimate great players like Harris LeVert, have done great things in the NBA, gave D'Angelo Russell his best season of his entire NBA career. He is now the head coach there. And you're giving Kenny Atkinson now an opportunity to coach guys that are far greater than anything he ever coached out there in Brooklyn. Now, I know we're going to say, obviously, he had the, the Brooklyn Nets situation, but that whole situation was a odd place. You had a placement where he was coaching the guys he got close to that he grew up this playoff team with were all of a sudden shipped out, traded out, whatever the case may be. He was no longer calling the shots. Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Harden eventually. All those guys were calling the shots, and it led to a very bad locker room situation out there in Brooklyn. They ended up wanting him fired in the rest of history. So those guys were there, but he wasn't really their coach. It was a very odd situation out there that I'm not going to get too more into, but Ultimately, I don't give a lot of blame for what happened out there in Brooklyn to Kenny Atkinson. I don't think he was at fault for that. He now comes to Cleveland, though, and I'm positive that he's only gotten better being able to learn from Steve Kerr and being a part of the Golden State Warriors situation and team over the past few years, that now he's going to head over to Cleveland and he gets to develop the likes of this entire roster that's filled with young guys that are extremely, extremely uber talented. And I think he's going to get the most out of each and every single one of these guys and develop them to become great NBA players. So let's break down the starting five, which he's going to coach. Right now, four guys are obviously locked in. Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, that's your backcourt. Then your front court is going to be led by Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Most likely, I think Max Struess will be the starting small four for them, although you could easily switch around the rotation where you have Karis LeVert starting for them as the Okoro. There's a lot of pieces here. That's why I think right now, let's just say Max Struess will be there. I think it will ultimately come down to a battle between Struess, Okoro. I think LeVert is going to be solidified as the sixth man for the season. Here's where I want to say, though. When I look at this team, I just talked a few minutes ago about Bickerstaff's roles for this team and how he had them placed the past couple of seasons. When you look at this roster, Donovan Mitchell immediately stands out to you and you're going to say he's the best player on the Cleveland Cavaliers. No disagreement with that. However, there's a guy in Cleveland, and Evan Mobley, who I believe has the potential to be a top-tier NBA player. That breakout could have potentially occurred Last season, injuries hindered that from occurring. But if he's given the keys to this team and he takes over, there's no reason that Evan Mobley does not have the potential to be a top 10, for sure top 15 NBA player in the NBA. There's no reason that Evan Mobley is not currently being discussed among the elite young players in the entire NBA. He has the potential to be that guy. 
He is one of the premier defensive players in the entire NBA. But on the other side of the game, I think he has the potential to be an elite offensive player as well, if given the opportunity to actually develop and carry out those attributes and skills that I know he's capable of doing. So what I ask and what, what I'm intrigued to see now is can Kenny Atkinson develop Evan Mobley and put him in a position where this team ends up becoming built around him? Because if you have Evan Mobley reach the potential of what he's capable of being, where he is a premier forward in the NBA, the most important positions in the NBA, and he is one of the premier and potentially even the best defensive player in the NBA, maybe I'll only give Victor Wembanyama the, the slight edge or a large lead edge over him overall young defensive prospects, but one of the premier defensive players in the entire NBA that has a skill set to be in a dominant offensive player, he can be the guy you build this entire team around and you become a dynamic duo with Donovan Mitchell. And then Darius Garland and Jared Allen are obviously filling into their roles. Garland's essentially the third option on that roster. Jared Allen's the rim protector and also an elite defensive player. If you rewrote, rewrite this rotation and you have the situation that I just talked about where you allow Mobley to be the guy, truly give him the keys. He has to stay healthy for this to occur. This team makes a jump from a team that I consider being a, you know, top maybe five, four, three seed, whatever the case may be in the Eastern Conference to being a legitimate contender this year. Well, I certainly still look at them and say they have a shot at winning an NBA championship. There are some questionable holes that I have on this roster that I will look at and say, okay, are they a legitimate contender if they're not played the correct way by Kenny Atkinson? But I think that if Atkinson gets these guys in the right situation, right order, and develops in the right in the right ways, the Cavaliers are a team that we're going to be able to look at as legitimate NBA contenders this year. And so, yes, you have a backcourt, Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, two of the really obviously put two guys that are both top 10, top five guys at the certain positions. Both guys form one of the premier dynamic duos in the backcourt in the entire NBA. You can trust both of those guys to be legitimate guys that can win you basketball games, but also carry you deep into the playoffs, especially considering the other guys they have on this roster. So that's one of the premier backcourts in the NBA. You get that locked in. Then you have one of the best dynamic duos in the back in the front court and Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, both of which are guys that I, you can easily trust elite defensive players. Jared Allen's one of the premier rim threat or lob threats in the NBA. And then you have Evan Mobley, who is an all-around offensive player if that potential is tapped into. And when you talk about those guys, I don't think we give enough credit to the fact that they have four guys that are legitimate all-stars or borderline all-stars, if you want to call it. And they still have really solid depth on this team. And that is what makes the Cleveland Cavaliers very, very unique. Because there's not a lot of teams that can say that. There's not a team that has four guys from top to bottom, there's something that obviously you can contend with. Obviously, I'll look at Minnesota, look at a few other teams that you might take over them. But there's very few teams that you look at and you could say some star power in terms of Garland, Mitchell, Mobley, Allen, that is much better than that. They are one of the premier star talents in the entire NBA, and the bench is that much different. They have very, very talented bench as well. So let's hop into that bench now. I think the start, the sixth man that I think should be solidified that in that role is Karis LeVert. I think he has all the intangibles to become a legitimate sixth man of the year type player. He is that good of a guy where I think if you just allow him to truly thrive in a six-man role, he'll be perfect for that role for them. And then I said you have the battle between Struis and Okoro, the opposite guy that does not win the starting job. You can kind of throw him there in at seventh man or whatever the case may be. After those two guys, though, there are starts to be a little bit of a drop-off in terms of trustworthy talent. I still like Dean Wade a lot where I consider him the eighth man on this roster, but then you have some questions. I personally like Jalen Tyson a lot. Great draft pick by the Cleveland Cavaliers. The only thing I have is that, okay, you have a lot of guys at that 2-3 that I already trust a lot. Donovan Mitchell is obviously a superstar. And then you talk about Karis LeVert, a guy that I think could be one of the best six men in the year if that's the role they give him this season. And then you have the, the combination of, of Okoro and Struess that I've also been discussing. So I don't see where there's a lot of minutes for him this year, but he's a very, very talented guy. And if Kenny Atkinson can develop him, he will be a core piece of this roster going forward in the future. And he will also be a guy that could potentially fight for minutes and, and maybe even give you some flexibility to move one of those guys I've discussed to open up a spot for Tyson to go in there and play. And then you address one of these holes I'm going to get into shortly. Because here's where the issue is for the Cleveland Cavaliers. There were a lot of injuries last year before Allen and Mobley and in terms of being able to be consistently playing and whatnot. And there's not really depth behind them. Dean Wade, I like. Niang is another guy I do like. He's he's good. He plays. Obviously, you can always trust him to go in the game and play for you guys. He's an Iron Man type of guy. He's a hard worker. He plays his role great. So I'm not down on him by any means. But you specifically look at backup center. Tristan Thompson is not a guy that I want to say is your only backup. 
Because if Allen goes out for a game, then you have Tristan Thompson. Nobody's backing him up. So that is my biggest thing that I look at for the Cavaliers. They need another center on that team. And then you head over to shooting guard. That's the most, I think, solidified spot between Mitchell. Don, and then you have Don Mitchell. You have Karis LeVert. And then you have Sam Merrill, another guy that's a, a high IQ player, a guy that plays his role well, good locker room guy overall. I don't mind Sam Merrill at all. He's a good play, player to have there as your third string shooting guard. But here's where the ultimately the biggest question marks I have for this team is. It's backup point guard. The guys that's going to be backing up Darius Garland. Jerome and Craig Porter are not two guys that I am extremely high on that or could be contending backups for your duo between Donovan Mitchell and Garrett Garland, whoever's going to be running the point guard. That's something that I have to question a lot there. And that's why I said the point that if you could possibly get to a situation where Tyson is consistently playing and you trust in him, and then you can make a move where you trade off Struce or Kuro or you move the Levert, whatever the case may be, and you open up and go get yourself a point guard, that's huge. Ty Jerome can be a solid backup point guard. I'm not going to say that, but I'm just thinking there's a lot of upgrades that would help this team a lot to upgrade on Ty Jerome. Craig Porter, I do like him. He showed a lot of flashes last season, and I think he's a guy you can trust. But I'm not going to be sitting here right now confidently saying that I trust those two guys to be a championship level backup for Darius Garland. Just that I'm not going to be sitting here saying I'm very confident in Tristan Thompson being the backup to Jared Allen, the lone backup to Jared Allen. Thompson can be a great third string. They need a backup center. So those are really my only two weaknesses on this team. Ultimately, at the end of the day, they have a lot of talent. They have a lot of guys that I look at and say, hey, you have one roster spot open. You could address one of those things as well. But you have all the necessary pieces to make a deep playoff run this year. If Kenny Atkinson coaches the way I think he's going to, they also have the pieces in place to be a legitimate contender. At this point in time, I don't know exactly how Atkinson will coach this team. So it's hard for me to be able to give you guys a legitimate answer as to say, okay, I know exactly the style is going to produce and bring to Cleveland this year. But if it is as, as I would assume it's going to be by allowing Mobley to have a much long, much larger leash, this team could legitimately become a contender in the NBA this season. We're not shocked me if they are the team that wins it all. The last thing I want to touch upon with the Cleveland Cavaliers is that the two-way spots. They have Imani Bates, JT Thor, Luke Travers. Luke Travers was drafted a couple years ago. He's going to be a guy coming over to the state side now. He's on a two-way deal. JT Thor played the Charlotte Hornets the past couple years. A solid addition there for, for the two-way spot. And Amani Bates, we all know who he is and what he's been able to produce for this roster overall as well. So I do like the addition of, of those guys. I don't know if any of them will be on the actual rotation in the roster this year, but those are guys to keep an eye on that are on the two-way deal. So ultimately, that's what I have for you guys on the Cleveland Cavaliers, a team that certainly is heading into the season as a top echelons of teams. But will they be the actual contender? Will they actually have a chance at winning the NBA championship? I have just slight of that because I don't know exactly the style they're going to produce. But if Mobley can reach his potential this year and make that big jump, this team immediately takes a jump into that top, top tier of being a team that could possibly walk away this season with an NBA championship added to their team's history.